In today's video, I have a recording of another fantastic presentation I attended at the recent fully charged live show in Sydney. This session was entitled, Is China the Key to Cheaper EVs? And with some insightful discussion from panelists and a huge amount of questions from the eager and capacity crowd, it's well worth a watch. So stay with me. Hi, my name's Greg and welcome to Electric Car Australia, the Aussie YouTube channel for those wanting to learn a little more about EVs and sustainable living technologies from a real living and breathing EV owner. That's me. Now I recorded this session so you could hear from experts in electric vehicles, EV markets and particularly their thoughts on Chinese EV manufacturers and their importance in delivering affordable EVs to Australia. Hosted by Elliot Richards from The Fully Charged Show and joined by Aussie YouTube sensation Tom Garn, better known as Tesla Tom from the Ludicrous Feed YouTube channel, Bridie Schmidt, longtime EV advocate and journalist, Charles Lay from the Australian Automotive Group, and finally Mark Harland, the COO at EV Direct, the Australian distributor of BYD vehicles. Now I've got my own ideas on Chinese EVs in Australia, but I'd really love to hear your thoughts on the video. So please leave your comments and thoughts in the comments section. Oh, and I'll leave links to the speakers' bios and their YouTube channels in the show notes. So if you wanna check those out, by all means, please do so. I'm sure you'll enjoy the video. And if you do, give it the thumbs up, share it with your mates, and do all that other good stuff that supports the channel. So let's get into it and hand over to Elliot, the resident Chinese correspondent from the Fully Charged Live Show. Hello everyone, good morning and welcome to our next panel in the Mega Theatre. This is one I'm quite familiar with. Uh, it's the, is China the key to cheaper cars? I'm very excited about this one uh, as it's my topic of expertise, I suppose. But here to help me today, I've got uh, four lovely panelists who are going to introduce themselves now. So Tom, do you want to start? Hi everyone, my name is Tom Gann. I'm from the YouTube channel Ludicrous Feed. Uh, we started the channel in 2018 to show the realities of um, electric vehicle ownership from the ground up, so to speak. Uh, and for credibility, I'm actually designed in China, uh, made in Malaysia, but tested in Australia. So. <laughs> Thank you for having uh, some insight into that today. And I am Bridie Schmidt. I'm an electric vehicle journalist and advocate. Formerly um, wrote for The Driven since 2018. and. Up here to yeah, just talk about what's coming on new in the market over the next few years. Hi, I'm Charles Lau, and I represent Aon Australia, the approved distributors of GAC Aon. And hopefully, in the coming year or two, we'll be able to bring some exciting new vehicles to the market. Mark Harlan, Chief Operating Officer at BYD in Australia. So I grew up on the automotive side, on the retail side in Canada, and then spent 20 years with General Motors, including a chapter in, in China before joining BYD more recently. Thank you. Uh, so, I mean, where do we start with this topic? Because uh, it's obviously quite uh, a big topic, and I think what we've seen over the past two to three years, especially in China, is these legacy brands who are really struggling against the, uh, the new automakers in China. So for example, I read a stat yesterday which said BYD sales are up 70% in China year over year. Toyota's down, Honda's down, VW's down. So all the legacy brands are down. So Tom, I'm going to ask you a question. Is it too late for legacy? Yes. <laughs> It's never too late. It's um, it's better to be late than never. I think uh, it's, you know they they've seen what Tesla are doing. They've seen what the idea are doing. What Polestar's trying to do. What what um, Volvo are trying to do as well. So you know I think they need to wake up and uh, smell the roses. I think it's time to change, and there's no time like the present. 
Yeah, I feel there's, uh, they've been sleeping a long time, especially Toyota. I know we give Toyota a lot of jip on the, the channel, but it's true, they've been sleeping in the wheel, and now the Chinese are selling in Japan. They're selling BYD in Japan, uh, and it's only going to increase over the next few years. So how has China managed to do this? So I think this is a question for you, Mark. How has China managed to do this? You used to work at GM in China. Yeah. So what's the difference? What's changed? Uh, so there's two ways to answer it. Is, is one is they've learned fast, so there's, they're learning, moving at pace, and the innovation is just amazing there. And so we could talk about the technology, could talk about the batteries and vertical integration and all those things like that. Um, I think, though, if I were to put my finger on one thing that they're doing differently is they're listening to the customer. They're listening to the customer, and then they're making changes. So the nice thing about an electric vehicle versus petrol or diesel is you go, oh, I can do that with software. I can make that change tomorrow in 24 hours, right? Versus redoing an engine. So they're listening to the customers, they're hearing the customers, and not just in China, but now as they move into global markets, they're listening and, uh, and changing quickly. Yeah, I've got a, quite a good example. I drove in a Neo car uh, up to the north of China. We started in Harbin, which is very, very far north. It's about minus 15 degrees. We went in February. And then we drove right to the north, uh, to the border with Russia. And there's only one charging network up there, uh, and it's a Neo one. And it's minus 36 at the top, so it's very, very cold. Not good for uh, electric cars. And one of the charges was frozen. It was 11.30 at night, it was minus 30 degrees. All we did, we called the Neo guys and said, right, hang on, we're going to send an engineer out. Five minutes later, the engineer was there. He said, right, this is what you do, fixed it, done. We're in the middle of nowhere. And so that's the level of service that the customers in China are getting and are expecting. And I think it's what they can do better than legacy. So I think it's a very exciting time. So Charles, what, what can China do better than legacy? As Mark has mentioned, uh, China is very quick to learn and adapt with new products as their customers give feedback to what their expectations are on the car. Uh, China is also investing hundreds of billions of dollars into what we call manufacturer tech hubs. Uh, kind of like the Silicon Valley where they list or identify a leading manufacturer and they entice and grant the manufacturing into related industries to move their head offices and factories next to the, that key OEM. So that what that is designed to do is to reduce the R&D time to bring new products out to market to reduce the cost of manufacturing and transport and reduce any uh, potential delays as we know the cost of vehicles know today uh, a large part of it is attributed to the delay or lack of supply of vehicles so with that introduction and as they grow and expand the EV market there we should then see a, an array of vehicles that are cheaper uh, more affordable and that are potentially even smarter and more intelligent so I think uh, a lot of you probably know the Wuling Mini EV who would like to see that in Australia or something like that similar to that a very small electric car for a lot, a lot of money. Yeah, most people. So you guys have to take that back to your bosses, okay? Give them a bit of feedback, yeah? Um, and so, Bridie, you've been writing about electric cars for about five years, which is a long time to write about electric cars in Australia. <laughs> so, what change have you noticed in the past year, year two, what, sorry, one to two years? And is China the key to cheaper cars, in your opinion? Well, it has been China that has been coming in with the most affordable cars on the market. And we saw the ZSEV from MG come out um, a year or two ago, and it at the time was the cheapest. And since then, of course, we've had the BYD at A3 come in, and I think it currently has the holds the title of the most affordable EV in Australia. Um, whether or not it's about to lose that, I think we're waiting to see because MG, of course, just launched the MG4 here. Um, there's uh, a rumour going about that it may come out around the 40,000 k mark, but whether or not they can do that will be the real question. Yeah, the price is, is such a key thing, but it's not just the price, but there's a stigma against made in China products. And for me, this is my first time out of China for four years. Uh, last time I kept, went, left China was in 2019. The world was a very different place. You know, these Chinese EVs hadn't really made a mark on the world stage, and here we are four years later, and they're going to every country. But there's still that 
cultural bias against made in China. So Tom, how can these companies overcome that? How can they change that uh, opinion? Yeah, so I can actually speak from personal experience. I came to Australia in 1988 with a family, so I've actually experienced a lot of prejudice uh, in this country, and it's taken my family a long time, a whole generation, to prove ourselves as uh, new migrants in this country. And I can understand why there's some skepticism around a new product, but particularly from China. You know, uh, it's, it's a different market, uh, it's, it's untested, it's unproven in, in the Western world, particularly in Australia. And I think it will take a generation for that to occur, for people to almost evangelize the product. You know, you'll see your uncle, your auntie, your father, your, your, your friend or colleague driving a BYD Auto 3, uh, you know, a, an MG ZS, an, an, e, an Aeon, a uh, Neo, whatever comes next. And you go, you know what, that's actually pretty good. It's, uh, it's doing the job. Uh, it's not catching fire. Um, <laughs> it's charging great. They can go to Melbourne or Brisbane in it. Uh, you know, I give it a try. And I think, I think that's the same what we've experienced as new migrants in the country in the last 30, 40 years. And I, you know, these guys are okay, like, you know, they might look different, but they're still doing the job, they're hard working, and hopefully EVs will be the same as well for China. So, we know that, you know, we've seen legacy automakers such as Mercedes, Audi, BMW, they make very good quality cars. They're ICE cars, but they make very good quality cars. So, Brighty, in your opinion, you know, you've probably driven a lot of cars. Do you think these Chinese automakers can compete with that quality, even match it, or even exceed it in the next few years? I think, I mean, obviously, yeah, Europe is very well known for its quality manufacturing, but I think it's not so much um, the European manufacturers that they're competing with, it's Tesla. And, I mean, Tesla had fit and finish issues at the beginning, but what we're seeing coming out of China and that sort of vehicles that we see come here now are from the Shanghai factory. And it's not just the quality, I think, of the vehicles, but also the way we interact with the vehicles. And, you know, I, I drove the first ZSEV, and it was very familiar in terms of the traditional vehicle sort of format, um, but it was worlds apart from, you know, sort of the touchscreen experience of the Tesla. That's not what everyone wants, but it is the direction that the industry is moving in. And what we're seeing now, like, you know, with the new BYDs, and, and I haven't seen any of the ions, but I'm looking forward to it, but the MG, as well with you know sort of double touch screen and it's it's um it's not just about you know the upholstery and you know the, the, the way the car looks but also the way you interact with it and that's something that I think the Chinese are doing really well. Yeah I think you know I've driven a lot of cars in China it's pretty outstanding the tech they packed inside. I drove a Hi-Fi Z, does anyone know Hi-Fi? They're super expensive, ridiculous, uh, massive uh, expensive cars, packed full of technology. So I drove the Hi-Fi Z, it's got LED screens in the doors. <laughs> so you can program it to say hello or welcome and it flashes up this message when you open the door. It didn't actually work. <laughs> and I think sometimes they try and pack in too much technology. It's like, no, we've got to pack in you know, this one or that one. And my biggest problem at the moment is that there's a race to who can have the biggest kind of press release this year. So we're going to have lasers on top of the car. And then six weeks later, everyone's got lasers on the car. And then, oh, we're going to have cat logos on the car. Then everyone's got cat logos. So it's obviously stupid examples, but uh, you see what I mean? There's a race to make headlines without actually thinking what the user needs. Uh, whereas they look quite like, you know, BYD, GAC, they're a bit more sensible. They make it for the everyday user. You know, they're not trying to make headlines uh, so much. So obviously, I'm going to go back to Toyota. You know, Toyota have been messing around. Uh, you know, their chairman just left recently, after a long time. Uh, do you, Charles and Mark, think it's too late for Toyota? <laughs> it's, a, it's a dangerous question. I, I think, to flip that question a bit, I think, uh, for me personally, if we, if we look at the landscape in Australia, it's about presenting as many good options to get us to EV, you know, penetration 50%, 75%, 100%, to get as quickly as possible. So, yes, Toyota is is lagging everyone else. I think they will catch up at one point. But the way we view it from a BYD point of view is we want to um, democratize in many ways the EV and make it affordable 
uh, provide the range, provide the customer support, provide the network uh, to help you know grow the EV market in Australia. So I think that's probably the most important thing right now is giving as many options to Australian consumers as possible. And that's what we're focused on is giving options to the consumer. So I kind of skirted that question. Didn't yeah, you I? did very well. Thank you. <laughs> Charles? And I think Mark's hit the ball there. Um, is in regards to bringing more products into the market, I think with the increased competition, um, it will force the manufacturers, both existing and newcomers, to continually invest and improve in making the next generation smarter and more intelligent vehicles that we demand. As we demand more from our cars, that we want basically want our cars to do more than just get us to A to B, um, we should hopefully get those vehicles in and Toyota and the legacy makers eventually will catch up and I guess you could say wake up and then create vehicles that we want in order to stay in the marketplace. Well done, good question. Good answer, sorry. Let me, uh, I'm going to tell you about Toyota because <laughs> there's a story which I saw this morning in the press in China. Uh, you know the new Toyota EV car, the BZ, whatever it's called, I don't know what it is. Yeah, three, whatever. Um, so that car is not selling very well in China, so they've reduced the price of the car by about 8,000 US dollars. Still not selling. So one dealership has said, if you buy this electric car, we will give you a free hybrid car. <laughs> and they've already sold two. So that's plus two sales for Toyota in China, so well done. Uh, I don't think it's going to last very long though. Um, so obviously there's a lot of new electric cars coming to Australia in the next few years. GAC I'm excited to see coming as well. I love your, your products, they're all over Guangzhou. Um, but Tom, what's the most exciting EVs that you think are going to come to Australia in the next few years? Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Neo took a battery swap technology uh, uh, and apologies to my guests, I guess here for that, and I'll mention another brand. But I think they're doing a battery stop program in the uh, in Europe on the continent, so you can literally drive it and swap your batteries out in five minutes. Um, that will really change the game. So you don't actually own the battery; you just own the shell of the vehicle. So you don't have to worry about battery degradation all those issues. The company owns the batteries, and then they, they use the batteries for storage as well um, for the grid. So it's a double win for consumers and the and the car manufacturers. So. I mean, I'd love to pull up to a, a stop uh, on the road trip to Melbourne or Brisbane and change the battery in five minutes and be on my way one day. So, yeah, I think I think um, I think that's one I would love to see in Australia. Can I jump in there too? Of course. Because there was something that I was reading about Neo that I thought was really interesting for the Australian market as well. And um, we did have news last year that the ET5 has been prepped for the UK market, which means yes. it will be made in right-hand drive. Yes which means it's got more chance of coming here. But the other thing that's really interesting is that there's talk of being able to swap out different size batteries. So what that means is, you know, you could, when you're just going to be driving around urban centres, have a smaller battery and you're going to get better energy efficiency because the battery's lighter. But if you do need to go for a long range trip, you can swap out for a larger battery and bingo, you don't have to rely on charging infrastructure quite so much. So I think that could be a real game changer for the Australian market. And are there any EVs that you're uh, that you've seen in China that you think, ooh, I'd quite like that to come over to Australia? That's a question to all panelists. Um, yes. So uh, we'll have a chance actually. Uh, the team is going up to the Shanghai Auto Show in April, and then we're going to do a tour of the different BYD facilities. So we're pretty excited about it. And again, being a customer-driven organization, they they come to us on a regular basis, and there's uh, there's team here. Uh, talking to local engineers, understanding the local driving conditions. And the really exciting thing is they've got things on the drawing board that they can make reality in a number of months. So other OEMs I've been at, you go, I'd really like to have that for Australia. And they say, okay, we'll talk to you in 2030. And here at BYD, you go, you know, we'd really love to have a Ute in Australia because Australians love Utes for a lot of, a lot of good reasons. And they go, okay. We'll take that feedback on board, and uh, so I'm looking forward to seeing some different uh, things on the drawing board, if not on the drawing board, in the studio, in the design studio when I go up in April. So, being customer folks, of course, we've got other vehicles and a few people have been talking about. Um, whether the names stick or not, we can debate that later after, like Dolphin and Seal and things like that. But 
we're going to fill in the uh, we are going to fill in the range relatively quickly here, and there are going to be cars that are specifically designed for the Australian market, not take something that was designed for another market and try to retrofit it for Australia. We're going to be designing things and bringing them to this market first. I think as our cities get denser, I'd love to see a small car like the Seagull actually. Um, that'd be great for Uber or car share. Because sometimes you get across town, it's really hard actually to find an Uber to do that for you. But if it's, there's more of them around uh, for a quick trip across town, or um, yeah, that you know, we'd have to own a vehicle if you're living in an apartment, you can just rely on car share or, or ride share. Yeah, no, we've, we've got a long list. Uh, of cars that we're asking for. So, uh, so yeah, what we can tell you is what's coming in the next year or so, and uh, which has been right, with, with the whole point of sale. And then the rest of the stuff is, you know, based on the market needs. So that's where I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. I think a lot of people are curious about when the seal is coming, but you won't tell me yet. <laughs> I tried. But we can talk about the name off the rip. Oh, okay. <laughs> We can take a vote in here. Who wants a different name? Who likes the who likes the dolphin name or the seal name? There we go. What? Wait. So dolphin or let's start with dolphin. Dolphin. Yeah. Okay. See. See you. You're off. Uh, <laughs> seal. See, we're customer driven. Seal. Yes or no? Yeah. It's about a 50-50. Okay. We've got this recorded. Thank you. I've clearly been out. outside of. Uh, it's stuck in China for too long. I thought they were terrible names. Oh, well, I know nothing. Um, I mean, a big part of what you just touched on was uh, the utes and the utility vehicles and the trucks and all of this. So, um, do you think that's the key to perhaps bringing more of these vehicles from China into Australia? Is that getting more people into EVs? Do you think people would like things like the the radar that we see by GV, the pickup truck? I have no idea why they built that in China. It's banned in Shanghai, it's banned in Hangzhou where it's made. No one drives pickup trucks in China. So that's clearly made for a market like Australia. So do you think we should start off by having those vehicles first or is there more of a need for the smaller vehicles? Or just, just more vehicles? Choices, okay, so choices, <laughs> so I'll leave it over. I've spoken enough, but I like choices. Okay. I think, I think when we look at Australian vehicle sales, it's pretty obvious that Utes is a big segment that needs to be transitioned. Um, so the sooner that we get sort of larger electric Utes that are going to be appealing to the Australian market and also uh, changing, changing the perception in, in the wider driving community. You know, there's things about Utes that could be really great for tradespeople, having a battery that they can charge tools off and you know, not having noisy diesel gem sets running at sites, that sort of thing. So there's so many benefits to transitioning that particular segment. Um, we know also that the, the youth segment in particular is driven by massive um, tax write-offs. So price is not as such an issue as it is for the private, you know, private vehicle market. Um, so yeah, I think that that, that electric youth segment is most important. I was seeing the um, LDV launch the um, Ute last year, and I think um, the feedback was it was it is a little expensive for what it is. Um, I think it's single motor, uh, based on the ice platform, not a huge payload. So I think the conditions need to be right. I spoke to a lot of traders who say yes, that they love one, but the price has to be right to be able to carry enough. Um, obviously, the range has to be good too, but. Less, less important for day-to-day -day use, you can charge it in over course, you can cut up the capability, or charge at lunchtime, or charge at the work site, so I think the possibilities are definitely there. Um, and so what, last question, and we'll open it uh, to the floor for questions. What one piece of advice would you give to a Chinese EV manufacturer who's coming to Australia? What would you say? What's like the one key feature they need to do, or do they need to produce more? What, what, what would you tell them? If you could speak to one of the CEOs. And maybe you two can. I love to answer. That's that's the the oh, for me, it's uh, we've we've talked about the vehicle and, and providing choice on the vehicles, but it, and then it's also setting up the network, right? So it's the service, it's the parts, it's it's the supply chains, it's those kind of things. To me, that's uh, it's really important to have that support from the customer. So whether they're in rural. Victoria or other parts of the country that they have somewhere to go to get service, they have charging infrastructure and capability. So it's
me, it's building out the, the infrastructure, not just charging infrastructure, but service parts and uh, all of those things as well. And I'd, I'd add also that the, the handover experience for customers is so, so important. It's still, it, it's a new technology. It is actually quite a large learning curve. We do see, you know, I, on my way down here, um, to the show, I stopped in Scone to charge at the NRMA charger there, and as I was standing at the charger, a gentleman came up and he said, do you mind if I just ask you a few questions? Um, he'd just taken delivery of a Volvo XC40, but he didn't drive He didn't drive it up to um, the Hunter because he wasn't sure if he'd be able to charge it up there. Now, there's several chargers up there, and I asked him, do you have plug share? And he said, yes, I've got plug share, but I can't work out where to put my payment details in. I was like, oh. You actually need to download this app, download this app, put your details in there. And you know, they're, they're the sort of things that customers really need to know when, when they have, because it's, it's a massive learning curve. And unless you go actively seeking the information, it's, um, it, it can be difficult to access. So yeah, I, th I think that's something that we like to see a lot of. So on the back of what Mark and Bridie said, I think the customer service and the explanation on these electric vehicles, the way you charge and use these cars, do need to be, I guess, uh, elaborated to these customers. That as Bridie said, they, they are new to this product. Yes, it does drive you from A to B, but I, mean, I guess the in-between charging process of, the, I guess, the FAQs on to what to do at certain points in time or what troubleshooting you might have with these electric vehicles, I think the manufacturers will need to be able to perfect the way they uh, deliver these cars on the collection time, the way they explain to the customers how these cars are used on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think the manufacturers and users alike are uh, starting to learn as they understand uh, these cars. Uh, most uh, EVs on the market at the moment um, they obviously brought in by manufacturers that traditionally would sell in retail cars and, and, and most of the time uh, uh, we can call delivering or collecting these cars for customers uh, as if it was a, a normal petrol hybrid car and I don't think they put that much extra effort in there to show customers and tell them how to use this particular car and I think by improving that will help everyone's understanding of EVs and will potentially get more people to convert over to EVs as well. Good stuff, I look forward to seeing GOC soon in Australia. <laughs> uh, okay, we've got a few minutes for questions, so I'm going to lock this at someone's head. So who wants to I'll start? Like to yeah, soft. Right, I'm going to lock it to you. I sat in a newly delivered e uh, Chinese EV just yesterday and was surprised to find a uh, a, a cigarette lighter in the actual cigarette lighter board. What, <laughs> what cultural differences do you think there's going to be bringing Chinese vehicles into the Australian market? What's going to have to adapt in that direction? Not cigarette lighters, but... Uh, <laughs> again, I think uh, it, it is a learning curve, so I don't think anyone is perfect right now. So, so for if there's any manufacturer in the world who says they're perfect, they've nailed every market condition, they're, they're definitely uh, lying. So I think it's how quick you can respond to the local market needs. And the one great thing about EVs is if, if you nail the battery, if you start off with a fantastic battery, which helps you know control costs if you get a safe car on top, then a lot of it is over the airway, right? A lot of it is software after that. So it's it's continuing to be open and learning about local market conditions. Hardware is a little more difficult to change, but software can be changed overnight. Yeah, for me, it's um, it's the language. Sometimes the software um, on the touch screen, it, looks, it sounds a bit funny. It's obviously been translated from Chinese into English, so I think they might need to hire people to uh, westernize some of the language used in the, in the top of the buttons you use. No, you don't, by the way. <laughs> I think you're right, because I've driven in cars which have got the English interface, and it just doesn't work, and it's a bit rubbish. Um, and I think also, you know, there's things in Chinese cars like KTV, the microphone. I know the BYD in, in, uh, in China has a microphone. A lot of them come with a microphone and KTV. Uh, so that probably won't come to Australia. Unless there's demand. Is there demand? <laughs> so, can we take another vote here? <laughs> Who wants a microphone so we can do KTV? Uh, we'll take that one back. <laughs> um, 
And I think, you know, a lot of the voice, uh, like controls and the technology, it's more su su suited to a Chinese market. It's, it's very naggy. The, like, the GPS, it's like, there's a light, there's a camera, there's a camera, there's a camera. It's like, shut up. So it's just too much. So I think that is always going to be software. Okay. Right, do you want to lob the... Oh. Yeah, thanks. Um, I quite like my Anko toaster and my Anko kettle and my Anko underwear, but I'm not concerned that the Chinese government can take them off me at any, uh, any um, period of time. Uh, should Australia have a strategic concern that we, if we upset China, that we could potentially expose ourselves to these things being interrupted with? <laughs> <laughs> this is a very challenging question. Um, I think, you know, I, I don't think we should be too worried. You know, China is, people in China are there to make money, to make the economy stronger. It's not there to disrupt the rest of the world. Yeah, you can have a Chinese car in Australia, maybe it sends some data back to China, but that's probably going to be the extent of it. I wouldn't be too concerned about it. Obviously, I've got no idea. Um, <laughs> but for me, it wouldn't concern me. Um, I don't think you should be worried. I mean, your phones, I think everyone's phone in here is Chinese. So it's already too late. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Well, I 
sorry if we've run out of time. Um, I'd love to speak for another hour, but I'm sure everyone gets a bit bored of that. So I just want to say, uh, join me in a big round of applause for all of our wonderful guests. Well, that's it for another video. As you'll notice, I'm out in my outdoor studio again. It worked so well last time. Don't need to worry too much about lighting and all that sort of stuff. So I thought I'd give it a shot. So leave some comments in the show notes about the outdoor studio or what you thought about Chinese EVs and the impact they may or may not have in the Australian EV market, particularly around that budget end of the EVs, which is an area they're certainly targeting at the moment. If you have been, thank you very much for watching. I really appreciate it. If you've liked the video, give it the thumbs up. Do all that good stuff to support the channel. If you'd like to flick us a couple of dollars, I'll include those donation links um, in the screen as well. And I really do appreciate my financial supporters. They certainly help keep the channel on the road. And that's it. Take care. Stay safe. Look after your friends and family. And until next time, cheers.